Around our apiary here, we have a whole bunch of perennial wildflowers that I purchased from Eden Brothers. This whole area used to be, well actually, right about through here and toward me was grass, just like this, it was lawn. Back there we had a brush pile from like three years of living here, accumulation of brush that we had removed. And then all of this was enclosed, it was all wooded, so it was enclosed with uh, shrub growth and, and trees and whatnot. Cleaned all that out to put the apiary in. So you can see here, the flowers took really well to this rich soil that was underneath all this tree cover. Back there also took very well underneath our brush pile. Out here, this is where we had lawn, and it just didn't really take very well through here, especially right in this area. So what I'm gonna do, I've got a handful of uh, a mixture of annual and perennial seeds. I couldn't even tell you what's in there. I know there's some lavender, sunflowers, dill, chives, just a mixture of a whole bunch of type of seeds. So I'm gonna go through and just kind of lightly rake this area, uh, broadcast my seed, and let it be. Um, some of them will get picked off by birds, some of them are not gonna sow, uh, and some of them will take, and we'll just, we'll just let nature do its thing. So inevitably I just ripped out some beneficial flowers that I planted in here that I that are want in there, but that's all right. Um, there's so many flowers around that are doing well. They're gonna drop their seed later this season and, and their seed will take root. And so gotta lose a little to gain some. I actually raked out a fair amount of uh, dead undergrowth. So I will be able to use that as a straw to throw over my seed to help mat it down, hide it from the birds and uh, help it take root better. I mixed all my seeds together in a little baggie, so I'm gonna go ahead and just broadcast them on the soil now. I'm just gonna take some of that dead undergrowth and uh, spread it back over the seeds. This will also help retain some moisture to help the seeds germinate. Lightly walking all over this is just gonna help push the seed down a little bit so it gets good contact with the soil. We did get some rain this morning, so the soil's nice and wet right now. I tend to be more of a laid back gardener. I let mother nature do all the work for me, so I don't see myself coming out here and watering this ever. We'll just let Mother Nature do her thing, and whatever takes, takes. Is it just me, or does it only seem to rain on the weekends? It's kind of a bummer. So it's rained the majority of the day today. Haven't really got as much done as I was hoping to, but I wanted to take a minute to uh, show you guys one of the few disease issues we have here on the Green Acre. Um, it's called cedar apple rust. It's a fungal disease that depends on two species to spread and develop. In the springtime, you can see these alien looking galls forming on our cedar and juniper trees. These galls will release a bunch of spores into the air that'll make their way to our apple trees and infect the leaves on the apple trees. In some cases, it can be severe enough that it will kill the apple tree. It literally creates a rust on the surface of the leaves of the apple tree which prevents the tree from photosynthesizing and the tree will die. Um, it hasn't been that bad on our property, but I suppose it could get that bad. I'm standing in our apple orchard and up on that side of the property, there's a bunch of cedars um, in that tree line and they're all infected. And then we also have this tree here, which is infected. Um, I'd love to cut this tree down and replace it with something else. I get the vibe from the neighbors behind us that they like this privacy block here. Um, though I would replace it, obviously whatever I replace it with would take many years to, to become that size. So long as there are cedars or junipers and apple trees within proximity of each other, 
Uh, this disease is always going to exist, and I'm not about to uh, cut down my apple trees. I believe there is a, a spraying protocol I could use, but that's not really how I roll here. I kind of just let nature do its thing. Well, I don't use pesticides, herbicides, or insecticides anywhere on the property. I actually had a solicitor stop by the house today trying to get me to purchase a plan for her company to come out and spray our house for insects and spiders and bees and such. I told her I've got half a million honeybees out back and some native bees and uh, I kind of just let nature do its thing. She right away uh, switched the topic to mosquitoes. Well, we, we fog for mosquitoes too. And I uh, told her I've got a bat house out back. The bats kind of take care of the mosquitoes for me. I don't know. I just don't believe in spraying chemicals all over my property. Just let natural ecology take care of itself. All right, it's the following day. Pretty much rained all day yesterday. I really didn't get anything done, outside at least. I spent well over two hours morel hunting with my sister on some new land, some public land in the area that I hadn't uh, hunted before. Only ended up leaving the woods with a couple of ticks on me and no mushrooms. That's how it goes sometimes though. It's why they're so expensive, because they're hard to find. So something I want to work on today is transplanting my Ozark strawberries out of my asparagus bed and into a bed of their own. Strawberries and asparagus make good companion plants. Unfortunately, my bed was not fenced in and the rabbits pretty much destroyed all my strawberries last year. But we do have some rhizome growth that is flowering now. So before these ones get destroyed, I want to pull them out of this bed and put them in a, an established bed I've already got that's already fenced in. They're growing, they're alive. I'm not going to say they're doing fantastic though, because if you look over at my neighbor's strawberries, hers are uh, much taller and much more flowery. So I pulled a few strawberry plants. I'm gonna get those transplanted over here. And then I'll work on getting the rest of them transplanted over here as well. This soil on this bed's always been really nice. Super, super dark, nice and rich. I've added a lot of compost and worm castings to this over the years. So the strawberries should uh, enjoy this spot. I had to be careful digging these strawberries out because of the asparagus crowns that were surrounding them. So I just have bare root strawberry transplants here. Some of them are flowering. I'm just gonna do my best to bury these roots as deeply as I can get them without burying the crown of the plant because we don't want to cause any rot issues. Just lightly press them into the ground Honestly, this soil is looking so good, I don't think I'm going to have to add any anything to it. Uh, just put the mulch back over the top of it when I'm done. This is a uh, this is a runner. Strawberry plants will send out runners, and that's how they spread. They're, they're basically rhizomes that are above ground, 
Although I guess strawberries might send these underground as well. So I'm gonna transplant all these over here, uh, cover them up with mulch and give them a good watering. This is a great example of strawberry runners. Right here we have the mother plant, which sent out a runner, which established another plant that sent out a runner and established yet another plant. So there's three plants that are connected together. Say hi, little man. Just woke up from a nap. So I got all of our strawberries transplanted. Hopefully some of these take. I'm sure some of them are gonna die from transplant shock. Honestly, all we need is one or two to take root and they'll send out runners and they'll take over this bed in a matter of years. So that's what we're hoping for. Gonna give these guys a good watering now and uh, move on to the asparagus bed. I'm gonna plant some seed that I saved. So what I wanna do with our asparagus bed now, since the asparagus is pretty good at standing alone, it doesn't have any pest issues as far as rabbits go or the occasional deer we get through here. I'm gonna turn this bed completely into asparagus. I planted, I think, 24 crowns in here four, four years ago or so. They've been doing a good job at spreading out. Every single crown has survived and has put up uh, asparagus every year. But I saved seed from some of our female plants in here last season, quite a bit of seed actually. Um, I did not cold stratify the seed. It's not necessary to do it. It might improve your germination rates a bit, but uh, I did not cold stratify it. So I'm just gonna rake away the center of the bed here where all the strawberries were planted and broadcast my asparagus seed and hope that that takes root uh, and germinates this, uh, this summer. Now that I've got the seed down, I'm gonna give it a good watering and then I'll cover it back up with the mulch to retain that moisture. One of the cool things about asparagus beds is once they're established, they can live 15, 20, 30 years in some cases in the same spot um, and be productive the whole time. It's one of the great benefits about growing perennials. It's a lot less work and they last a lot longer. Now that we've got our mulch covering it again, I'm gonna give it one more watering on top of that mulch to, to help hold the mulch in place. This mulch is a mixture of chip tree remains, broken down straw, leaves, some pine needles. Uh, over the course of four or five years now, it's broken down really well and, and really enriched that soil below it. Now that the strawberries are in the ground and my asparagus seed is sowed, I've got a handful of other vegetables I'm gonna plant.
All right, so I made a few mistakes with my B package installation that I want to go over with you today. I'm not in the business of hiding anything from you guys. I'm learning right alongside you. So I want to share my mistakes and hopefully prevent you from doing the same. So the first mistake, not a huge one, was when I put the pollen patties on, I tried removing the wax paper from one side of the patty. I did that because I've seen Scott do it before. It's kind of a, it's a pain in the ass and it just, it, it's messy. I never asked him why he did that and I believe he makes his own pollen patties so maybe there's a, a method to his madness for that. But I did some research and apparently you're supposed to keep that paper on the patty because it prevents it from drying out. The bees will just chew the paper off as they, as they consume the patty and uh, it also prevents hive beetles from laying their larva within the patty or something along those lines. Don't have to peel off the paper. Second mistake I made was when I put the queen cages in the hive, I spread the frames apart to fit that queen cage in there. When I pulled the queen cage out after releasing her, I neglected to push the frames all back together, leaving a larger than normal gap in between the center uh, center frames. When bees find an open spot like that, they're gonna make comb in it. That's just what they're designed to do. They started building, uh, I guess, the third thing here. I said not to go into the hive for like a month after introducing the queen. Uh, she's got to get her brood pattern down. It's a really sensitive time for the bees. You just want them to be left alone and, and do their thing. Um, I did go back in there and check my syrup levels. Uh, and in doing so, I decided to lift the, uh, the feeder off and take a look inside and check on the pollen patties. Um, the pollen patties were getting eaten up pretty well, which is great. They're using them. But while I was looking at those pollen patties, I noticed that I forgot to put those frames together. And they did start building about half the size of my palm, or my whole hand, half the size of my whole hand worth of comb inside that gap. I'm glad I caught it when I did. I took my hive tool and I cut that comb off. I laid it on the bottom board of the hive uh, so they could break it down, reuse the materials, and, and it's not gonna be wasted. Everything they did, they'll use it still, but by leaving that gap, I, I let them, I basically let them waste their time and uh, kind of bummed about that. I, but you know, it's part of living. You, you, you make mistakes and uh, you learn from them. Yeah, I cut that comb out. Uh, I squeeze the frames back together so there's a proper distance in there so they'll build out as much as they need and leave room for them to move between the frames um, and they won't have any extra space that way. So today I'm going to go back out there and put new pollen patties on to keep them fed. I'll check the sugar levels while I'm out there, the syrup levels I should say. Make sure their syrup is still filled up. And I also want to, uh, the, the entrance reducer I put on the front of the hive has a small hole, a, like a medium hole, and then you can take the entrance reducer out altogether and just, they have a normal entrance then. Uh, as I mentioned in the first video, we want that entrance reducer in there while they're getting established to help them. Uh, it reduces the amount of space they have to guard basically to keep unwanted predators out of their hive. Uh, there's a lot of other native bees, uh, other honey bees that'll, that'll go into a hive and, and rob them of their honey and their built up pollen and whatnot. It happens continuously throughout the year. There's always bees guarding that entrance and the smaller entrance they have, the smaller of an entrance they have to guard, the easier it is for them. But I'm seeing a lot of congestion. There's, there's a lot of bees trying to come in and out of that little hole. So what I'm going to do is uh, take that entrance, entrance reducer and flip it over to the next size up to give them a little bit more space to work with. So let's get out there. All right, so at the first hive here, I'm choosing not to smoke the bees right now, just because I don't really have a good reason. I'm getting buzzed right now. They're telling me, hey, stay away from our hive. We don't like it, but it's for their own good. Um, I did take my inner cover from below the telescoping cover and I moved it down here to kind of, I realized this tub here, it's shaped like a W. It allows them to come up in here and feed in the on the syrup but I don't want them coming up here and building comb. As I mentioned, wherever they find space, they're gonna build comb. So by putting that inner, inner cover here, it kinda keeps them a little more contained to the brood box down here, and hopefully it'll help prevent any comb being built inside this feeder. So let's get this off here. Just set this on the ground. 
Take this inner cover off quick. I do see some bridge comb in here. Looks like they've expanded out pretty good actually from when I was in here last. I should mention when I was in here last, I did pull one of the frames out and just give it a quick glance over. They had built out quite a bit of comb already and they were already, uh, the queen was already laying brood. So let me pull this out quick and uh, we'll take a quick glance before I put a new pollen, potty, pollen patty on. They completely ate the pollen patty that was on top of here so they definitely need a replacement. Bees are starting to get a little agitated now, as expected. Oh yeah, beautiful. She is laying very well. Let's see if we can get this to show up on there for you. Built out a lot of comb already and there's little larva in there. If I had another person out here with me, I could get some better footage for you. Man, they're capping a lot of honey already too. Here, I'll come over to this camera once. We'll see if we can get a better shot. There's a bunch of larvae in the screen there, down in the bottom of those cells. On the back side, there's a bunch of uh, honey being capped already. All right, as I said, I don't want to uh, be in here too long, so I'm gonna drop this back in here. Make sure I push the frames together so we don't get any of that um, unwanted comb being built in there. All right, let's get that pollen patty on here for them. And I want to set this uh, off, the, off to the side a little bit so it's not so it's not directly over for their hole to get up into the feeder. Perfect. Syrup levels are still looking good. Bees are buzzing my face like crazy. Lost one down in the syrup here. There you go. All right, let's cover this hive back up. Second hive, there's still a little bit of pollen patty left. You can actually see them consuming it as we speak here. But I'm gonna add another one back here just to give them another supply to keep working on. This hive seems a little bit slower than the previous hive I was in, but they're doing what they need to. say both colonies are looking very healthy so I'm very happy to see that got them set up with new pollen patties their syrup levels are looking good both queens are laying larvas growing very quick in there from the time she lays an egg to the time that the larva turns into a bee and, and comes out of the cell is about 20 some days so pretty soon here we should have the first batch of larva coming out as, uh, as bees. The average lifespan of a worker bee is only about 30 days. 
So we want to get those youngsters coming out as soon as possible. But I think that's going to wrap up this video. I got bees that followed me in the garage. Um, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Hope you learned. Learn something, learn some things from my mistakes, and uh, get out there and enjoy the great outdoors. Catch you guys in the next video. Take care.